the knock at the door always filled me with excitement because there was no telling who would be on the other side I'm of that sure. door. Sure. My name is Doug Barlett and I'm the founder of Visaboard and uh, I'm here in uh, Brooklyn, New York at Greenpoint Audio, a brand new studio construction by uh, Richard Alderson and uh, Richard is a friend of mine and a very well-known studio designer in New York and has been here for many years. I, um, I'm happy to be here to, uh, to celebrate the uh, completion of this studio. It's an excellent job and overall I'm just so pleased to be part of it. My background uh, initially in terms of uh, acoustics relates to the music industry and uh, I've been a bass player for a long time and and uh, been active in music production in terms of studio design and also running studios and, and that was a passion of mine as a more or less a semi-professional hobby in my entire life and continues to be and um, so one day I uh, received an email through the website early uh, uh, near the beginning of the Usaboard um, business and uh, it was it was from Richard and uh, he was looking for a sample for for a project that he was doing and um, so when I looked up who he was and realized uh, his background with uh, with um, you know all the, uh, the most important musical characters uh, in the New York area during the years that he's been operating here, musical personalities, it's, it's, uh, it was something that I was very attracted to. So I, um, I came down and got to know Richard and saw his projects uh, develop and, and uh, we established a, a really, really strong rapport with each other. And Richard carried me into other projects as well and, and uh, it's been a really great relationship. So now that Greenpoint is uh, is near its completion, uh, I wanted to come down and and uh, to congratu congratulate him, and also to um, to uh, to capture on video um, this important achievement of his at this point in his career. Well, because I lived on Bleecker Street and Bob was just one of the characters that was hanging out and performing uh, in the neighborhood, I became his friend. Uh, it wasn't any big deal at first. Uh, this was before he became famous. And uh, I just became uh, one of his street friends. Okay. And uh, he asked, uh, so someone asked me if I wanted to record at the Gaslight. He, he was doing some after hours performances to test his new material because he was just starting to write songs. And I showed up and I was just at the right time in the right place, which is what makes a famous recording engineer. It's just being, it's just luck because it doesn't matter much. Uh, if you have the basic skills to be a recording engineer, um, it doesn't much matter, uh, but it, it makes a big difference who you record mm -hmm. and what you record. Here, Judas. Yeah. So, again, I haven't read it yet, but I, I had just scanned through it when we were getting set up here today. And um, so, the, the themes, you know, obviously centers around that tour, the first tour with the band in Europe, 
and and very strong reaction of to, Dylan going from folk music to yeah electric. My my theory was that Dylan was originally a rock and roller, and that he became a folk music person because that was the only format that his songs could exist in. Hmm. But the first chance that he had to go back to an electric band, he did. So and he had an electric band before. Well, yes. Yeah. He in, in in high school he okay. played in an electric okay. band. Okay, there you go. And uh, uh, yes, he originally was a rock and roller, and then he became a folky because he wrote very topical songs. Right. And the only place where topical songs could be accepted was in the folk music world. Right. And that was very popular at the time. Right. But Dylan decided that he wanted to be a, a, a rock and roller and go on tour with the band. So he went on tour with, with the band and people didn't understand it and they thought that he betrayed himself by switching to electric and that's where the Judas name comes right. from because mm -hmm. they called him Judas. Right. But what a in take. fact it was all invented. Right, right. So um you knew him and you'd recorded for him, so naturally he calls you and says, Hey, I'm going to Europe, you wanna come along and this kind of thing? Yeah. Well, we, we the first concerts were in Hawaii, and the, the second series of concerts were in Australia. And we did the whole country of Australia, which isn't much. It's uh, a lot of geography, but very few cities. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sydney, uh, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Perth, and that's about it. And they're all on the outside of the island and mm -hmm. it's a very big island mm -hmm. but we did the whole tour there and it was the height of the Vietnam War so uh, the supposition is that Dylan's manager who basically was responsible for the sound system and it hired me uh, um, Robert Grossman decided to leave the original sound system in Australia, hmm. and uh, the supposition is that he couldn't get it chipped in time for the next concert, which was in Stockholm, Sweden. So he sent me back to New York, the other uh, in the other direction, to build another sound system. So I built a duplicate of it and met them in Stockholm. Got that on a boat and sent it over? Did you yeah, fly it over? Yeah, we flew it over. Wow. And um, we did Stockholm and Copenhagen, and then we did all the British Isles, and then we did Paris, and then we were back in London hmm. for the concert. And, and, that, and that was the entire thing. Well, and given you know the nature of this book and the strong reaction to that tour, I mean, what did you see uh, yourself firsthand? Anything come well, to mind? Well, I, I was confused because I always <laughs> thought that Bob, it was a natural thing to Bob to, to be with the band. And I loved the material that he was doing as a rock and roller. Uh, I wasn't so strong on the folk music stuff. Um, it's not that I didn't like it, but I was much happier when he was with the band. But were people reacting negatively at the yes. shows, like yeah. like strongly? Yes, really. Very. They, they were booing him. He would do the first half of the concert as a standalone, uh, doing his old material, and then the second half he would come out with the band, and very often the the audience would boo him. And it was all a setup. I mean, it, it, it really didn't have any basis in fact. Mm. But uh, somehow the rumor got started that he was doing something that he shouldn't be doing. Right. And what, what happened 
was that um, I recorded everything because Bob thought he was going to make a movie of the European tour, which never got made huh. or was a failure. But uh, five years ago, more or less, uh, the, all the material f for the movie was edited by Scorsese and uh, simultaneously with that, they they dug the recordings that I'd made uh, out of the vault because Bob saved everything that he ever did, hmm. and they the tapes belonged to him. And Sony said, "Hey, these things are really good." And I said, "They were really good all along, but nobody <laughs> paid any attention to me." And um, so they put them all out as a box set. Is that this, this box one set here? Yeah. And so this is the entire European tour, everywhere that we were. Um, when did this get released? About five years ago. Okay. So it's the whole thing right yeah. there. How many CDs are in there? Uh, 30 some. 30 I can't some. remember. Great package. I think 33. Oh, it's really nice. Uh, but it was uh, very well received and it went into several printings and they nobody expected anybody to buy this the, the thing and it was uh, reviewed as uh, very well as serious music. Sixty-seven. Uh, Harry Belafonte who I'd also done live sound for, became my partner in the recording studio and invested a lot of money. And I bought the first multi-track recording setup. And it wasn't a very big room, but I did a lot of recording there. And um, I kind of got burnt out by 1969. I got... Uh, too much work all at once, and I wasn't <clears throat> ready for it, so I decamped to Mexico. How long were you down there for? Six years. Six years? Yeah, until 75. In Chiapas, I think you said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I built a recording studio there, and I had a, uh, uh, a folk group, and we, we recorded for Capitol, and nothing ever became of them, but I have some of the recordings. And you ship the gear from up here, down there? Uh, yes. Uh, there wasn't a lot of gear. I had a tape recorder and a couple of microphones. I recorded all the Indian music when I was in Chiapas because there was a lot of Native American music in Chiapas at the time. Uh, Folkways bought it originally, and then it ended up at the uh, Smithsonian, uh, which you can you can find it now uh, online. It's a uh, gin commercial, uh, and some advertising agency decided to make it a protest. I don't know why. And so here's Dylan. Uh, yeah. He saw the same poster. This, in front of this poster. And that's, uh, yeah, and so that's Joan Baez is on the other side. Let's see what the space looked like for the most part. Okay. Concrete floor. Exposed beams, a lot of pipes. Yeah. How old is this building? A uh, hundred years. Hmm. And what was the original it, purpose? Uh, it was heavy manufacturing. I think they they made motors here. Um, you know the you can see the structure is very 
heavy. Mm -hmm. And uh, beams are uh, like new, in, in spite of the fact they're a hundred years old. Wow. Yes. It's going to be a big uh, projection screen with mm -hmm. speakers behind it, and there's a workroom in the back. So. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be uh, mix and yes, yeah. and mix and a screening room. Okay. Excellent. You've used more or less the same technique as you did in the room we were just sitting in. Yes, exactly the yeah. same. The, the rooms are, have a very similar sound. Yeah. You know what's great too is standing here and looking. The door is open there, and you've got the, that's the original brick wall there. Yes, yeah, so right. The original so brick wall, which we cleaned and that's and great. Sealed. That's great. You know, we'd love to print that. We could print exactly that on Easeboard. That exact same organic brickwork. And but what what we have here too, what we've uh, supplied you um, with that slate brick. I mean, it it works nicely together. Yeah, it works know? very well. But. Um, we're we're doing a lot more in the print uh, direction with organic finishes coming up, and uh, always looking for the most rough material. You know, it looks a I'd lot more I natural. I love this pattern. Yeah, I, uh, me too. And, and, and I thought I would get tired of it, but I'm not yeah. at all. Base traps are for rooms that have excessive base in them, mm -hmm. which my room doesn't. Okay. Because the the ceiling is a big base trap, okay, and um, so there 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 isn't an enormous amount of base buildup in the back of the room. And is that one of the reasons in the corner you yes. didn't feel that you needed to put it? You don't want material? any corners, right? You don't want any corners. They're yeah. terrible. Yeah, and um, so I close them all off with 45 degree angles. Okay. And, and there were speakers above the air. And, and this was an easy, well, yeah. let's say an effective and simple way to approach the corners without having to get it's into extremely the extremely simple. Instead of reconstructing the wall. You know, I, I love this material, and I love the fact that it goes up as I used it as a wall covering, and it, it has ideal acoustics for me as applied, and I love the um, printed uh, fake stone, which fools a lot of people, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> they think it's real. We got more of that coming down to wood yeah. and other organic yeah, materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks very realistic, and um, this is the first room that we finished, and I used it in the booth and in uh, in my audio room, which is much smaller, and I used it in the same way on both walls in the big room, which isn't done yet. But it's very similar to this. It's just bigger. Well, you know, having come into this room, um, which is uh, entirely clad with the easeboard on all the walls um, and the also ceiling. the ceilings, you've got clouds up there that are offset from the ceiling and all. And it looks like you know you've um, you've got ex exposed um, ductwork and all that. It's all been insulated as well. Yep. Um, I'm amazed how balanced it is in this room. And I, I, it's not like I'm not familiar with my own product. What I, I am amazed at is that it is so absolutely balanced in here. I wasn't expecting I, that. I was also amazed. And be, <clears throat> because I had never used the material as extensively as this, and I never, I used it for clouds, 
but they were isolated. And I've used it for walls, but they were isolated. And in this case, I used it on everything. And I was amazed at how good it sounded because it works very well. And there's, there, there aren't a lot of tricks. The walls are parallel, except for the corners, which are cut off. And uh, there's a lot of absorbency in the ceiling because there's uh, blown in insulation above and there's about a foot of space above the easel board clouds, which is very effective. Mm -hmm. very, very and, gap. and I found that, that having an air gap it greatly in, uh, increases the acoustic uh, character of a room. Yeah, we, we promote that a lot in yeah. the commercial environments too. And the floor is just wood uh, laid on a, 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 a plastic uh, grid to keep it off the concrete. And the platform behind you is just a wooden platform filled with fiberglass and it was just covered with a carpet this week. Now, the material uh, that was shipped to you uh, by our plant in the Chicago area, um, was it shipped as full sheets or was it, uh, and you guys cut on the installation? Yeah. 40, f four by eight sheets on the gray, uh, on uh, printed material mm -hmm. and uh, uh, on the black, gray, dark gray, and light gray material. It was all four by eight sheets. Or so that was cut during the installation process yeah, by, by hand effectively, yeah? By hand, Yeah. with a, with a good mat knife on yeah. a table. And no real problem with that? It looks no, like the fit no, and finish is absolutely really good. No problem. Yeah. Have you got the space earmarked for a particular client already, or? Yes, kind of uh, NBC, uh, uh, We'll use this as a ADR room. So music uh, was an integral part of my upbringing of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I'm, a, I'm kind of a nerdy guy, so I wasn't always comfortable in my understanding of that, but as a kid, I was always inquisitive. So I'm the kid who would lay in front of the stereo and read the, uh, the credits on the album jacket. Mm -hmm. And I would ask my mother if I didn't know um, who a particular person was, I'd ask her, mm -hmm. who's this person? So this one particular day, um, I was reading through the instrument catalog for Latin percussion instruments. I thought myself a musician. Life has proven that as a musician, I'm a better technician. And I'm great with that because I found my niche, I found my right. passion. Mm -hmm. um, but my, I asked my mom, about this guy who was mentioned every other page uh, uh, within the Latin percussion catalog named Ralph McDonald. Who is this guy? Now, we, I uh, had seen his name on tons of records in my mom's record collection. And she said, oh, you want to know about him? Well, it just so happens that Ralph McDonald's family and my family grew up uh, in adjacent buildings. Mm -hmm on the same floor across the courtyard. So my mom was well acquainted with this family. Mm -hmm. And there was a celebration for Ralph McDonald's grandmother. You just spoke about right place, right time, being mm -hmm. a huge element mm -hmm. in you know, what paths we take. Yeah. So my mom took me to the celebration for his grandmother. It was commemorated uh, he was working on a project at the time uh, chronicling his family's journey from Africa to the Caribbean to America called The Path, recorded by Richard Olson. Hmm. 
Um, so I went to the celebration for his grandmother, and I was astounded. Okay, I could not, I could barely breathe when I met this person, this very human individual, who called my mother Aunt Mary. Hmm. And my mom said to him, my son wants to play, why don't you see if he's any good? And he invited me to a recording session. And that's the first time I met Richard Alderson. Hmm. And I've, yeah. I've never left. Where was that? That was at Rosebud Recording, which was located uh, on 48th Street and Broadway in Times Square, New York City. Was that Richard's studio? It was, it was, it was, a studio that Richard built. It was Richard's house, but it belonged to the partners of Antigua Music. Okay. Uh, Ralph McDonald, William Salter, William Eaton. It was their Ah, workplace. I see. So that's where they were kind of their songsmith uh, Absolutely. laboratory. And where the journey uh, as producers began. What was in there? Like, what what equipment was it? A eight track, four track? What in those days? When I first went, it was a sixteen track 16. Am Ooh, uh, Ampex two inch machine. Really? Yeah. And Richard mixed uh, at varying times. He mixed to half inch uh, non uh, half inch non noise reduction, then half inch Dolby, then quarter inch Dolby. And ultimately, before we closed the doors, we were mixing to digital the uh, Mitsubishi X80. So here's this heavily experienced engineer. By this point, he's 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 did all the Dylan stuff, right. did the big tour in Europe, lived through all that. Where you know Dylan went electric, even though he was electric before, and people only got to know him as folk, and he had to you know, had to face that, that right. whole challenge on that tour. He's lived all that by this point. So he, he in walks this 14 year old kid into the studio with all these guys that are kind of peers of Richard's at that point in the music business. I find it fascinating, it's a real human part of this story that uh, you, that he took you as this 14 year old kid under his wing to come and work with him. You know, what a, what a, what a positive characteristic for him to have done that, don't you think? I, I really do. I'm, I'm really grateful that I was accepted. Um, um, I, I had, even then, I had the ability to park. So, you know, I could be over in the corner and out of the way. And, oh, I'm sure if you got in the way, he it wouldn't have worked out as well as it did. I, you know, we all know about the coffee and sweeping the floor in studios, right? But, wow, exactly where my brain went. So yeah. um, it took me years uh, of doing, you know, running to the store and sweeping yeah. up and, yeah. you know, <laughs> being the gopher. Yeah. It took me years before I got to do what we affectionately call Cable Rap 101. Yeah. Okay, because that was the gig, okay? Um, I didn't get to touch a microphone. I didn't get to plug in a microphone, uh -huh. uh, much less touch the desk or the tapes. Maybe I got to carry the tapes down to the office or back upstairs, maybe. Um, but yeah, it took years before I got to do cable rap one-on-one, and I still rap cables in the way that Richard taught me to. Of course. Okay.